to please welcome today's moderator, Betty Alvarez, and director of Gladiator 2, Ridley Scott. film, huh? Just to give you a frame of reference, um, in the time that I made Alien Romulus, he made Napoleon and this. <laughs> so, you know, he's the youngest one here. Um, so, you know, tell me about it. one of the, the first things that I want to know, you know, when I met you and I started watching these films, is always uh, kind of the beginning of your process. Um, it's been said that the hardest thing about making movies is to actually choose the goddamn movie, you know, what is the movie. But it seems like for you that's not a, a challenge. You seem to know what you want to do right away. Is that true? Or has that evolved through the years? The, the plan is there's absolutely no plan. <laughs> and there never was right through school, so I was completely um, very bad academically, and all I could do is draw. And so uh, that becomes the base of my career. I can draw it all on my own board, so but that makes me very efficient. Uh, doing that, because you're filming on paper in your head before you get there. Uh, when I'm finished the film, uh, and having used 11 cameras by now, because that's why we do this in 40, 49 days. 59, you did this in 51 days. Wow. Um, but you, you, you got to know where to be. Don't try it if you don't know where to put the camera. Otherwise, you'd be still talking about it at four, five o'clock. <laughs> we actually shoot. I get going nine forty-five, eight forty-five every morning. Bang, and you're off and running. And we're doing Woody Allen hours. We're finishing at six o'clock, leaving and taking a walk, so the crew have a life of their own. But you have to know. Yeah, because people forget. I say rap. Thanks, boys, and walk. The crew's got an hour and a half packing up and cleaning cameras. People forget that. So, there's, a, there's another thing that you told me early on about this process of choosing the movie where you said, you know, I get the script and I go, let's go. I, I don't start to give notes on the script because you turn a go movie into development. You don't want that. You just want to go. And and then you kind of figure it out, which I think it's, it's so brave in a way because, uh, you know, most of you probably heard the story about it fact check me if it's this right, but on Gladiator 1, there was like roughly, I think you rip all the bad pages and you're left with 20 pages and you still win to create something as epic as that movie. And, uh, and so it shows an incredible amount of bravery, but also what, it's still like that, is that, do you still do that where you go, okay, I'll figure it out, it's an organic process, you figure out your drawings, that, you know, do you still dare, do you still do it that way? No, I'm actually pretty good with writers, believe it or not. Then you write in the room, no. then you write in the room. Yeah, so I'm actually quite good with writers, um, and slightly worse with actors. But um, with that, once I, I think there's a, a an idea there, or the script is there, rarely does a perfect script land on one's desk. And the last good one for me was actually Martian, actually. Everything else takes evolving and writing, so, and my best experience here ever was, I came to Hollywood with my first film called Blade Runner. <laughs> and Hampton, who's a great writer, um, who I think lives in New York now, I hope you still mind. Um, he had this beautiful play he had written in, in a nutshell, where the hunter falls in love with his quarry and vice versa. And he, I think, written it for himself because it was all contained in this apartment. And from that, I said, listen, your writing is great, a great idea. I said, but when he steps out the door, I want to see what the world's like to be able to support this idea of creating a human being. From that, we sat every day for five months, involved into this huge epic that at the end of the day came out and fought and killed, killed me, stone dead. But actually, that was my best experience as a writer. No, no, and you always figure it out somehow. It's like, a I guess there's a theme or something you cling to, and you go, like, okay, that's exciting enough, and then you're not scared of you know, what are the process you have to go through, and you'll do it, and you deliver it. Um, so when it comes to actually, you know, once you have a script, and uh, when it, you, it's amazing what you've done with cast, right? Because, you know, people obviously you guys know, like from 
Brad Pitt and Thelma Louise, like the Russell, of course, but you know, so, so Sigourney, so many actors that you discovered. So, what do you look for in those? What do you, you know, when you sit down and watch cast, what's is there any process there? What do you look for in that? Well, it's kind of you, because we're dealing in pictures. Who said a picture's worth a thousand words? Was that Hitchcock? She's not very bright, Mark. <laughs> <laughs> I think, it, I think it was Hitchcock because he used to draw all his own storyboards. But it's, so what I'm drawing, I usually have something in mind, usually dark or blonde or whatever it's going to be. And when you start the process of casting, I've got, I tend to get immediately pay attention to a picture of a person. If they're interesting, then I look at everything they've done so far. If hopefully that they've done things before, so I look at everything they've done to see what they've got in their palette, how what are they like as actors, and that said, with Paul Mescal, I tend to watch TV, but I tend to watch low, the the end that has low budget movies. The BFI have a good kind of little channel, so I look at I, I like to look at incoming rather than outgoing. I mean that's in, I'm included as outgoing, right? So so incoming is very interesting. So I caught this show called Normal People. It's not my kind of thing I would normally sit and watch, but the two actors were very good. Uh, there was Paul and the gal. And from that, I then binged on eight hours, and at the end of it, I made my mind that Paul would be the boosters and gladiator. That was it. It's how simple it is. But you've got to do your homework. And once you've got the right person, the first thing I do is make a partner of the person and the actor or the the fit actress, um, I get to know them, and we talk, so they loosen up, and I want to encourage them to come out and be my partner in the process. Um, I, you know, everybody directs differently. I mean, I, I thought it was a way of doing it, and the more I, I meet directors and you talk about how they do it, there's no one way, like everybody does it differently. I'm really curious about what is your, this is a very simple question, but I'm so curious about how you do it, like particularly because you have so many cameras, like uh, you show up on set, it is it Monday, uh, you know, 6 a.m. in the morning, and you have a scene with, well, let's go with simple, it's two actors and a fucking table. Like what is, what do you do? You tell them what is right away, you rehearse a little bit before you, well, how do you do it? Okay, two people talking, like, in, like you've seen in this movie. The only way of answering this is take my hat off to cameraman who actually have to put up with me in 11 cameras, okay? Because I know exactly where to put them. But, because I've preconceived the scene, so that sounds awful for the actors and awful for the cameraman because I'm saying I'm keeping it to myself. They all know way before we get to the floor, so the boards are then distributed. And if an actor or actress says, you know why can't I do this? I said, listen, let's see your way first, then you can see mine. And frequently, I've said, sat there, and they act, are there any actors in the room? <laughs> Thank God I'm going to say something. so. It's meant to be funny, dude. It's meant to be funny. So, um, uh, I, they were acting out, and they usually end up two guys standing in the middle of the room talking, and they said, That's really boring. And I said, That's really boring. So, there is a geometry to every scene. Even if the scene is simply two people sitting at a table, or a lot of movement in the scene, or a punch up, you have to have that in your head. So, I always go in knowing exactly what I want by knowing exactly what I want. There's a freedom to that, so I can then encourage people to put in ideas as well. Yeah, you, you always figure out a way to, to make, yes. there's n never a dull moment in your movie. That's what I'm always fascinated. I'm watching, and am I even, maybe I'm watching a movie, I, I'm, not, I'm fascinated with it. I don't know what they're talking about. I'm not particularly, but there's something about it. Even when I was a kid, when I was a teenager, I remember my friends shooting, we always say, let's do the Ridley Scott thing, and we'll put a fan with like volumetric lights spinning in the room. <laughs> so that was, that was a thing you invented, as far as my concern, in the late 80s, early 80s, and everything became so much interesting. <laughs> it was just this volumetric dynamic light. So you're, you're definitely a master, and this movie has plenty of those moments of how a scene that on paper you go, well, there are two people talking, you figure always a way to make them fascinated. Uh, okay, tough question. D difficult actor. For me, like, you know, I'm 46, uh, I, I haven't dealt with many big stars. You haven't dealt with all of them. And, and they're difficult. I mean, actors can be, you as everybody knows in this room, <laughs> and particularly a star can be very really difficult. You know, they're sitting at a table, it's gonna go, I'm not sitting, I'm not saying out of this line. So what, what, is, there a, is there a magic way to deal with that? Because for me, it's the worst day on set. 
when the actor doesn't want to do it and he's oh. someone important. Have you figured out a way around that? One of the biggest nightmares for us. Well, I carry some weight, so sometimes I scare the shit out of them. <laughs> that's, a, that's the first thing I've that. But then, way back when, um, I was, I, I always remember doing the duel of my very first film. And by then I was a really top-notch commercial maker. And, and my only competitors at that time were honestly Adrian Mann and Alan Parker. The rest, and it was a growing industry. I got to do a film, I never remember the first time, so I'm 40. And I was so successful, I wasn't noticing time was flying. And I got this low budget film going called The Duelists, and I needed a guy called Fouché. And Fouché was the mean guy in the political scene in Paris at the time. And Diana Quick was this wonderful actress I had in the film as a courtesan. And she said, you know, Albert will do Fouché. I said, I can't afford Albert. And so uh, she said, well, he'll do it for nothing if you show him the rushes. So I showed him the rushes, and I did, he did for a crate of red wine. Um, but when he came in, he was only pretty my age, because I would be 40. Albert may be 45 or something, but he scared the shit out of me, because his presence that particular one was so monumental in his reputation. Yeah, he's the simplest guy, very simple. Denzel is probably one of the finest actors we've got in America, right? And Denzel's earned his right to be tough. <laughs> and uh, that said, he doesn't, he doesn't, not long on explanations, okay? And I'm not long on explanations, so we get on very well. I mean, when we did, American Gangster, which I think I, one of my favorite films, um, he was a bit nervous that me being all by myself where we were shooting at that particular time, it was kind of a dangerous zone, which I was quite touched by that. I didn't think he cared that much. <laughs> um, so um, going a bit of the, of the post side of thing, I, I was, uh, I remember like, I think when you, when you when I show you the first cut of, of in Ramos of my film, you, you asked me, you look at it, you give me your thoughts, and you said like, how, how, how many days, um, how many times a week uh, do you go to your editorial, you said? I'm there every fucking hour of today, every day, Monday to Saturday. But yes, how many, which it was like, how, how many days should I go? And you said like, you should be there like, maybe once a month or every other week to look at it, because you know, this is really great advice, like, our biggest tool is our objectivity as a director, and the more you're there, the more you lost sight of what is the thing you're doing. So, but I, but I, but I remember walking out of that and going, God damn it! Like I'm doing everything wrong. I'm there all day. I'm supposed to be there a month, once a month. But then I thought, like maybe he didn't do that when he was making his fourth movie. How has that evolved for you? Like how much involved? How much you know? I'm sure you have figured out what's the right amount of percentage you need to be involved, and how when you have to step back. How has that evolved through the year, through the movies? You've got to, first of all, have a great editor. Um, and I eventually ended up, I've, I've always found great editors. And uh, I discovered when you sit in an editing room behind the editor, you usually fall out within about two weeks because you're either saying, make the cut, or he's, taking, he's make, uh, usually taking too long and pondering, which drove me crazy. And so I then decided, once I've delivered the film, the editor, in a way, becomes my book editor because I've delivered him the pages of the book. And a great book editor will then say, you need this, you don't need that. So I said, step away, let him get to it or get her to it. And actually, in the, I'll go, when I'm filming, they edit from day one. I don't sit and say, no one touches these rushes until I finish the movie. God, that's six months, even a two year process. Um, so I usually let them go at it from day one. And I turn up every Saturday morning and look at what they've got. I'll comment and move on. And then usually, because of that, we usually have a director's cut three weeks after principal photography is finished. That's yeah. how efficient it is. Wow. Same with mixing. Don't sit in the mix, it'll just get louder. Because your, <laughs> your, your ears turn inwards and you'll have a, like a Michael Bay movie. It's Michael Bay, so I'm sorry, Michael. <laughs> But you'll be, you, you, your hearing is gone. The only just get bigger and louder and louder. And um, I, I step away, so they say, we got a reel. I go in, and so amazing how clean you are. I've, I've become the clean one then, so I say, that, 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 and that. That's it. And that is, so you become useful at that point, rather than one of the, the 
So everyone's everyone's kind of kind of torn there. No, it, it, it is a thing that I, I think the goal uh, the goal of, of, of what we do at the end of the day is you know, you know you're, I'm sure a lot of you heard this principle there, what's called the twenty eighty principle, right? That is this analysis that says that you know eighty percent of the success of something depends on that twenty percent of elements involved in it, right? So. The more movies you make, usually the more you realize, you find yourself, I'm sure it happens to you all the time, that everybody's concerned about one particular element, they come to you, you go, Pfft. and everybody goes, how could he doesn't care? And it's because that's inside the percentage that won't make much of a difference. And, and you learn to be really surgical about like, this This is the part that really makes a difference, like the end of a movie, the cast, the, you know, whatever it is that you know, that, that I definitely don't. But, you know, you, you process that more and more and more, and I think that that is what I've seen in your process, that you really manage to narrow it down. What is the things, where do you have to be there? Yeah, right? I mean, everyone has their own way, so you've got to do your own thing. Of, of course, I what I do is I distance myself. As soon as I finish, I distance myself. Within a week, I'm starting my next subject. So I'm already going to be shooting my next film within about the next five, six weeks. So, so it enables you, it frees you up to go away, clear your head, come in, be very perceptive when you can then really help the editor or really help the mix. But if you've got to sit in the room and drive around crazy, do so. It's your time. <laughs> Is it, when I, I try to do, I, I, you know, try to do what your movies, it's hard, but you will know, um, you know, they say directors would make the same movie over and over. It's always a different version of a similar theme. Have you, like, looking back, watching your movies, go like, oh boy, I realize I have a thing with this. Is there one particular theme that kind of sneak up on you that you didn't even realize that you choose movies that has a, a certain theme or idea or relationship? Is there anything like that? No, they're all great. <laughs> <laughs> That's what they have to If it doesn't work, somebody didn't sell it properly. <laughs> well, like, talking about that, I mean, I tell this is a true story. Somebody... Dude, I've done two and a half thousand commercials. I know he's advertising so well, and I've never consulted about advertising. <laughs> yeah, I like I, one of the when people ask me about working with you, one of the takeaways, one one of the best advices, or things that I that are three of advice, something I learned just by by, by spending time with you and, and collaborating in a movie. Is it's a massive thing, and this is really important. It's like uh, you told me, like you gotta learn, you gotta love every movie you make, like like your children. Right? You love them all equally, not dependent on their successes and failures, and that's so important. I mean, I, I found myself naturally liking my movies that did better than the ones that did not so well, and I felt if you think about it as your kids, it's unfair. You gotta love them all, and, and, and it's a way better attitude. As that the attitude you definitely have. Are there any critics in the room? <laughs> okay. So, one thing I learned very quickly after Pauline Kael destroyed Blade Runner in four pages, I didn't even meet her. And to me, it almost walked in the column of industrial espionage because you're destroying a product before it's out. This is in the New Yorker. So, I was hurt. I was actually hurt. Even at 44, I can get hurt. Okay. And, um, I wrote back a note to the New York saying, listen, if you hate me that much, just don't print anything, ignore me, but don't spend four and a half pages of destruction. But the thing for me, what really became useful, I framed that as still in my office today, and I, it taught me this, there's only one critic that means anything, and that's you. So. Um. Sorry about that. Uh, there, there's, there's, I asked you this question a few days ago, but and, 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 I, and I love the answer, but I, I want to spoil it for anybody. I just want to ask you the question again. You know, I was telling Ridley. You know, you know, if you go through your career, like, you know, obviously you start amazing movies, Alien, and Blade Runner, and, and '91, Thelma and Louise. But then I think all of us in the '90s, there was a rebellion against anything good of the '80s. Everything was great in the '80s, '90s rebel, right? And so, and when it got, and there was all these filmmakers coming up. And so, most of the '90s, you, you obviously you did, uh, you know, Hocus Paradise, did White Squall, you did G.I. Jane, and they were great movies. But they weren't, they, they, they weren't out massive hits. They didn't work out that well. And at that point, you were sixty something. And I felt like I had my first flop when I was 40, and I felt, okay, I'm done. I gotta pack my, <laughs> you know, I'm done. I'm out of this business. I felt I was just, I felt destroyed emotionally. I felt like I had to quit. You were at that point. You made three movies that didn't really work. You were 60 something, and I would say at that point you would go, and you were busy doing commercials. You were doing fine, but but in the movies that was happening. And I asked Ridley, 
what the fuck did you learn or saw at the 98, 99, when suddenly everything changed? Because there's very few, you know, changes in a filmmaker in a career of director like the one you had at that point where suddenly, Blade, you know, uh, uh, I'm sorry, Gladiator comes out and you never stop a day. Like from that point on to today, you've been this, you know, making incredible films, epic films, David Lean epic size films that no one else does. So it asked really, what happened? What changed from a decade that was kind of slow to suddenly a change in attitude, a change in ability? What, 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 what happened? What do you think happened there that made you change so radically? It's a long answer, okay. Uh, um, uh, as 38, I realized I hadn't done a movie, so I had enough money to be able to find a writer, pay him, pay for the book, etc. And so from that, we got a prize at Cannes uh, with the first film, which was pretty good. And the studio here made seven prints on so my producer, Lord Putnam. I said, is this normal? He said, no, it's not. They, don't, they really don't know what to do with it. So the Jews had seven prints in the United States. So, I, but I think it was a great first film. So then I do Alien. What I learned with Alien is when you get something, you, and I was the fifth choice. Robert Altman was just before me. Why would you give Robert Altman Alien to do? That's not very, <laughs> that's not very smart. He was, he was the what? So um, because I'm a comic aficionado, not adult comics, but serious comics, because in a way, Alien and Blade Runner are very dark comics, okay? And Blade Runner particularly is a very dark comic. Um, and, and so I, the studio said, so what do you want in the script? And I learned, if you speak too much, you'll turn a go film into a development deal. So you shut the fuck up. And you say, it's wonderful. Really, no problem, no one. No, it's great. So now I'm out here. And in the time they take to decide to see me, I've drawn a storyboard for the first 20 minutes. So now the budget of the film was 4.2, which is four times what the, the jewelers cost, 800,000, right, all in. And I turn up there with my boards, and they look at the boards. This is key. A vision is key because that budget changed from 4.2 to 8.4 overnight. Laddie saw the what, what what it could be. He just doubled the budget. So then I do Blade on it. She destroyed me. Then I did Legend. That didn't work either, but it's running today. It's a bloody good movie. Yeah. And I was 25 years ahead of Disney. I haven't worked out yet. Turn your cartoons into live action. Take 30 years to do that, but I was doing it then. So. They, they, so there's only one film worked out of all of that lot, but they're not pretty good first four movies. And so I knew I'm on the right track. And so many students had said to me, why don't you do a, a film about normal people? I went, what the fuck does that mean? Because <laughs> uh, no one's normal, so you're totally boring, right? So I then um, came across a friend I was doing, I went back to television commercials, really high end stuff I was doing. And there's a French, in Paris, I had a French office. And so <clears throat> somebody said to me, I have a friend who would love to have lunch with you. He's got an idea for a film. And it's called Summer to Watch Over Me. It's about a cop falls in love with his, his guard. And so I met with him. And within 10 months, we were making the movie. Now, that didn't do well either. But these are all good movies, so there's something deeply wrong, either the audience or marketing. <laughs> I can go through all of you one. <laughs> but uh, the, the, you're, you know, I'm, I'm not bitter. I'm very happy where I am. <laughs> it's the best attitude that one can have. I think you know, it's the best attitude that one can have to just yeah. all your movies, to trust, keep going. But I think there, there was something you told me about that, at, like that moment, late '90s, when you saw, once you start this, you know amazing movies the last two decades from uh, from a gladiator to now so something in the lines of you told me like well it just decided that whatever it did it was never going to be a bad movie which so i think that's a fear of most director oh, yeah. if i choose this one it might not end up well it might not be bad but once you get to that place of trusting that it's never going to be bad as far as what you is bad movie right like I mean, people can say whatever they want about this one or that one but for you as long as you go I have the talent, I have the craft, it will be good. That, that is such a, a, a powerful thing for anybody here to trust. 
regardless of what stage you are, to trust yourself that it's going to be good. It's uh, going to make it work. Right? Yep. Was that a question? No, that was your answer. <laughs> that was your answer to that question. What happened there? Was it because I asked you if you made a pact with the devil in '99, and you said no, <laughs> because it, it felt that way to me. You know, people say, "Why is it taking so long to do gladiator?" I said, "It's 25 years. I've made, I think, either 17 or 21 movies since that. So I'm not sitting around agonizing over Blade Runner 2. So, gladiator 2. No, no, of course." Um, Okay, so we, there's, you know, when we talk about all your movies, I always wonder what if, you know, these days, and a lot, a lot of you guys here might have made, made uh, movies for streamings and uh, streamers, and I remember having a conversation with, with a friend when he was worried because he said, I made a, a couple of movies with, with one of the streamers, and they only exist in digital servers, that if this company go bankrupt, maybe they will just shut them up and those movies will disappear, you know. So the movies that are not on 35 mil, they're not printed, they might just disappear. So if, if, it will, if you would, for, hypothetically, if we came to that, if you could save just one of your movies to stay for humanity forever, you know, like to stay. You get the old guy that you save one, that you, to, that you wanted to stay for people to see for, you know, for another 100 years, which one would be? All, all of them. No, no. <laughs> you can not be all of them and it can I'm be this very, one. I'm very happy about everything I've done. Thank you very much. <laughs> <laughs> you see, he's like the kids. He, he doesn't want to pick go. one. I want to hear an answer. Okay, you're not going to give me an answer. One. you got to pick one. Come on. i got to press you. Uh, it's funny enough, uh, the jewelist, Jewel. the Lord, no, I'll take, I made a film for 65 pounds. Uh, called Boy in a Bicycle, and because I, I was at art school and in a cupboard with a bollocks, and asked the tutor, we're entering the summer holidays, and I said, can I borrow the bollocks in the summer holidays? He said, do you know how to use a camera? I said, no. He said, well, I said, well, there's an instruction book. And um, so, and there's a light meter, it's a Sarconic Brockway light, that's an old meter of Jesus. And uh, he said, you can't have it unless you have a script. So the week before the we broke up, and I wrote a script in a week. I was obsessed with the Ulysses at this point because the writer was so, um, I don't mean the guys with the helmets and shit like that. I mean the Irishman, right? Um, and he was so visual as a writer. I sat down for a week and wrote Stream of Consciousness. So, because we couldn't afford to do sound. And then now we're on holiday, now this is my little brother's who was the latest little son ever, who would lag on holidays, he wouldn't get up at two o'clock in the afternoon. And so, I managed to borrow my dad's car, and I said, Tony, who later did Top Gun, the wheels called, get out of bed, you're acting, we're gonna make a movie. And so we spent the next five, four and a half weeks in this really interesting, but pretty rough part of the world called Red Car, the ICI Imperial Chemical Industry. We made this film. And it's surprisingly uh, emotionally sensitive. And Tony actually could have been a really good actor. That's it. I'll keep that one. That one, I love that. I love that. It's, it's, um, I love that because it feels like uh, Rosebud. It's your Rosebud. It's that thing that everybody's waiting for. Is it going to be play around? Is it going to do this thing? What is the thing that this master will keep? And is the slate? Is that first memory? Is that an original thing that really means something to yeah, you? Yeah. But I showed it recently because it's now online. I didn't know that it was online. And I'm working with Graham King. Anybody know Graham King? I'm, I'm doing the beaches with him in the autumn. And uh, Graham is this very successful producer. And he revealed to me that he'd found it and seen it, and he was quite touched. That really touched me, that this tough guy could be quite touched. <laughs> I love that. So to, to wrap it up, I have to ask you a question. Like, how, you know, I know you shot this movie in Malta, you, you shot all over the place. I feel already I'm too old. Every time I move to another country to make a movie and I pack my things and I go, like, God the hell, I want to be at home. How can we, how can we, do you think you will make any of these movies in LA? How, how can we make that happen? How are we going to bring yeah. movies back to Los Angeles? We're going to talk politics now. Why cannot we make movies in Los Angeles? You know why. Because to try and do, you explained to me that the quantum effect of how things escalate, if you want to do one day shoot here, makes it impossible. We've really got to change the rules and rethink to help whoever says yes to 
a tax rebate here. Look, I used to own a studio in London uh, called Shepherd Studios. And um, we were very well run. And I, I bought 22 stages, uh, plastic shop, workshops, two restaurants, medical center, etc., etc., for 12 and a half million pounds. It would probably be just about the price of your garage. <laughs> so um, from that, uh, we did good business with commercials, a few TV shows, and occasionally you get a film in. I made Alien entirely at Shepard Studios, and Tony made The Hunger at Shepard Studios, so that's how efficient it was. Um, and uh, I couldn't get the word, I was relying on film for real profit, and they weren't incoming. So at that moment, I remember going to David Putnam and Attenborough, Rick, uh, Richard, um, and said, listen, go to the government and get a proper amount of money, not 200 million, you want about two, three billion as tax fund, tax rebates, things, to encourage people to come in, because you've got some of the best crews in the world. The same here, I think Stephen once said to me, you know what, the problem is we've forgotten how to make a rock look like a rock, because we don't make movies yet. It's tragic, you invented it, try and get it back. Thank you so much. Thank you everybody for coming today.